What's up guys, welcome to another episode of Get Sight where we look at all things mental health and psychology. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and like today's video if you're enjoying it. Now today we're going to be taking a look at a topic that at one point or another impacts all of us, anxiety. This is such an important topic for these times. With coronavirus and COVID having such an impact on our society, on our everyday life, we've all at one point or another experienced anxiety. I know for sure I have, whether that's been social anxiety, if you've had even much of an opportunity to socialize, whether that's been anxiety in the workplace as you've maybe had to change environments and working, whether that's been anxiety with uh, the future, which I think is a big thing when it comes to coronavirus and COVID. I think in one way or another, all of us have experienced anxiety to a degree that perhaps we've never experienced it before. And today we're going to take a look at my top tips on managing anxiety and some of the ways in which people make mistakes in the management of their anxiety from my experience. So make sure to watch right to the end of today's video to get the most out of it. Now, let's kick off by thinking what exactly is anxiety? Now in truth, anxiety is actually something that's a bit vague but also when we start to break it down it can make a lot of sense when we're looking at the meaning. One of the things I always say to clients or I say to anybody is that anxiety is what we call the intolerance of uncertainty. Now, you think again about coronavirus. You think about what we're going through as a, you know, as a kind of global society right now. The situation is hugely uncertain and particularly maybe about six or seven months ago it was even more uncertain. That situation, that uncertainty was unchanging. There was nothing we could directly do to create more certainty. How tolerant we were of that certainty or how tolerant we currently are of that, that uncertainty is going to determine our anxiety. You look at it this way. If I have an uncertain situation and I can't tolerate it, I can't deal with the fact that this is uncertain and I try and bring certainty to it or I try and impose change where I can, obviously my anxiety is going to go up. If I could see this uncertain situation and say, do you know what? For now, I can kind of tolerate this or I can tolerate this to a degree. I can make changes elsewhere and I can just, I can understand that this is an uncertain situation. My anxiety is going to go down. So anxiety really is all about the intolerance of uncertainty. Where then does our anxiety come from? Well, that's a really subjective question. I think in many ways, um, often when we talk about mental illnesses or we talk about mental health difficulties, we talk about that kind of nature and nurture debate, don't we? And yeah, I think there's probably something to be said about a genetic uh, disposition when it comes to mental health difficulties. We talk often about some really kind of uh, serious mental health difficulties like bipolar or schizophrenia. And actually, there's a really high genetic correlation when you know parents maybe have schizophrenia. It's very likely that offspring are going to have it as well. But I also think there is something to be said about other mental health difficulties like depression and anxiety. I think if parents or close loved ones or caregivers to some degree have been anxious or have experienced high anxiety, the likelihood is, is that children are going to experience that too. Now, is that a genetic makeup that's passed down? I don't know. Is that the fact that that young person has maybe been around more anxious people and just learned the behavioral and cognitive patterns of anxious individuals? Maybe that's more of the case. It's a very subjective thing though. I think also uh, negative experiences and early life experiences are a big factor when it comes to understanding where our anxiety has come from. If we've had negative experiences growing up or we've had really traumatic experiences in particular, then we're gonna feel you know, a certain level of anxiety. I mean, put it like this, if you're in a horrible car crash when you were 10 years old, into your 30s, it's probably predictable that you will have some level of anxiety when you're in a car to some degree or when you're on a busy motorway or something to that effect. So our early life experiences have a big impact on where our anxiety actually comes from. I really wanted this video to be as practical as possible for people and, and before I get into the real, um, you know, the steps that I would put in place or that I try and put in place for myself and, and assist clients with when managing their anxiety, I thought it would be really helpful to look at some of the pitfalls um, I see people fall into when they try to manage their anxiety because I think often in society we do a lot of different things that might not be that helpful that we think are helpful when it comes to managing that anxiety. Often what happens is, is that people become hypersensitive to their anxiety. Now, what I mean by this is that whenever I have a client or somebody that I've worked with or somebody I talk with who's experienced really high anxiety, 
whenever they feel anxiety, it becomes a, a, a more serious thing. That, high, that hypersensitivity really does increase um, in anxiety. And actually, you know, say I, say I have really high generalized anxiety disorder. If I go to a social situation or a new work situation and I feel that level of anxiety, I might say, oh no, like I'm feeling that anxiety again. I need to do something about this. Oh my goodness, this anxiety is back. You can, you can tell that that's driving more anxiety. It's not curbing the anxiety, it's making it worse. So actually that hypersensitivity to anxiety can be a really detrimental factor for people that are trying to overcome their anxiety. Another thing that I often see people do that's, that's maybe not as effective for managing their anxiety is that they focus only on coping strategies, not the undercurrents of what causes their anxiety. Now, this is a bit of a, a challenge for me as a, as, a, as a psychologist because I do very much believe in the power of coping strategies and we may even, we're gonna look at some of those later on in the video, so stay tuned for those because we are gonna take a look at them. But if we only work on those and we forget about the undercurrents of what actually causes our anxiety, we really miss the point. It's like having this really significant issue that we don't really wanna to touch, that we don't wanna deal with, and we just wanna stick plasters on it with, these, with the coping strategies. That's belittling coping strategies a little bit because they're not exactly just plasters. But if we don't understand the un undercurrents of what causes our anxiety, we are very much missing the point, and those coping strategies are gonna have limited effectiveness. People also consist uh, continuously avoid situations that bring them anxiety. Now this kind of comes to one of the things I say to clients is that one of our objectives when it comes to managing anxiety is to avoid avoidant behaviors. And I use that as a bit of a pun because we need to try and recognize where our avoidant behaviors are and tackle them. Continuously avoiding situations that bring anxiety is a very fast track to bringing us into to more anxiety. Let's look at an example. Again, if I'm going to a party with loads of new people and I'm a socially anxious individual, what I might do is, I'm, is say, I'm actually not gonna go, I can't, I can't deal with it, I can't face it. What I do in that situation is I perpetuate the sense that there is something to avoid and make that situation bigger. Rather than going into the situation, tackling it head on and realizing actually it could have been quite an enjoyable situation. Maybe it's not gonna be totally relaxing, but for, for one part or another, it wasn't as bad as I first thought. If I avoid those situations, they become bigger, they mean more, they can become more and more detrimental to my anxiety. So consistently avoiding situations brings more anxiety. It's the kind of thing that people think is gonna help them. So like look at an agoraphobic, somebody who locks themselves in their house because they're scared of getting attacked when they go outside. They absolutely are protecting themselves from getting attacked because they're in their, their house. But what they're doing is they're perpetuating that idea that there's something to be scared of. So the fact is that actually they're probably less, less and less likely as the days continue to go outside, their lives are becoming more limited. They're becoming more and more anxious about the outside world. People also often, in my experience, feel that they need their anxiety in order to function. And actually what can happen is that there can be a fear of life without their anxiety. And this is a really strange barrier, but one that actually makes a lot of sense um, when I'm being empathic with many clients that I work with or people that I speak to about anxiety, is that actually people build a very strong relationship with their anxiety protects them to a degree. Yes, it may not be um, comfortable, it may not even be very pleasant, and it may even limit our lives to a, de a great, degree, great degree, but it's absolutely keeping us safe from a perceived threat. So one of the barriers, or one of the things that I find often in trying, get, trying to help people overcome their anxiety is getting them to buy into a process that they can have life without anxiety, that they don't necessarily need that anxiety to, to function. One of the biggest barriers I experience is trying to talk people into that or, or, or convince people to some degree, if that's an appropriate word for, for psychotherapy, to, to buy into a, a belief of life without anxiety. And that can actually be very scary for people, understandably. One of the things that I often realize in, in one of the ways in which people try and manage their anxiety that isn't as helpful is they try to fix, fix, fix. So they see anxiety and they say, right, okay, I need to try and deal with this. I've got this anxiety here, I need to get over this, I need to do something, why isn't this working? And again, you can start to see how the anxiety can start to really spike actually. Yes, it's appropriate to recognize anxiety, yes, it's appropriate to deal with it, but it's also important to know that in many ways, it's okay to have anxiety. And that's one of the things I always say to clients is that, anxiety. this is one of the reasons why I actually love working with anxiety, is it's very different to any other kind of mental health difficulty or mental illness. It's actually one of those mental health difficulties that we need a little bit of. You know, if somebody comes to therapy and they've got really bad depression, we want to try and get rid of that depression. We don't want to try and convince somebody, do you know what, you need a little bit of depression in your life. That's not the case at all. 
we do need a little bit of anxiety. If I was to hear a bomb go off outside right now, or if I was to hear gunshots outside right now, I should definitely feel anxious. If I didn't feel anxious, I'd be under threat, I'd be at risk. You know, if you're in, a, in work and a fire alarm goes off and you don't feel anxious, you're probably just gonna sit and continue to do your work as the floor gets hot. So you need anxiety. And th this process of trying to fix, fix, fix that anxiety and panic that it's there can make the anxiety worse. We need to know that it's okay to have that anxiety. This kind of leads me on to my next point, or my final point actually, on one of the ways in which people um, try to manage their anxiety ineffectively, and I see this in clients as well, is that they want to get totally rid of that anxiety. We absolutely can't do that, and from my previous point, as I've explained, nor should we. It would be really detrimental to us, it'd be actually incredibly dangerous to us if we had a life without anxiety. And even having that conversation with clients sometimes or people can be really helpful. Recognizing that it's okay to feel anxious sometimes. It's okay to wake up in the morning sometimes and have just an underlying sense of anxiety. I recognize that and I understand that that's not very pleasant at times, but it's okay for it to be there. So how do we actually start to manage our anxiety? Well, one of the key forms of therapy or approaches to therapy that I really like using when it comes to management anxiety is acceptance and commitment therapy or ACT. And this allows in many ways space for us to accept our anxiety. One of the things that we try and do with anxiety sometimes is we try to lock it up in a cage and we say, oh no, here comes that anxiety again. I need to do something about it. I need to, I need to get it sorted and deal with it. And actually if we do that, it's gonna just grow and grow and grow. Acceptance and commitment therapy kind of says in, in, a, in a kind of general sense that you know it's okay to allow yourself to feel that anxiety, allow the, the anxiety actually to, to, to sweep over you. It's okay to, to feel that. Sometimes, and I've never done this myself because I, I don't really feel like, well, I think there's probably ethical boundaries to this as well and competency boundaries to a degree. Therapists who are very versed in acceptance and commitment therapy when working with people with panic attacks, assist them by inducing a panic attack sometimes in therapy. Now, not every therapist does this who work in ACT. I'm just saying that this is an example. One of the ways that people have more panic attacks is that they're scared to have panic attacks. And so an acceptance and commitment therapist might say, let's induce a panic attack in this you know, room, and they may do that via different means, to show you that it's okay to have it. You're not gonna die. And one of the, that's one of the, the, the fears with people with uh, panic attacks is that they are gonna die. You can feel like that. If you've ever had a panic attack, you'll know. But actually allowing yourself to accept the panic can be very helpful knowing that you're gonna be okay. And it goes the same with uh, anxiety. The other side to acceptance and commitment therapy is to commit to changes that we can make. Accept that level of anxiety to, to a degree but commit to certain behavioral or cognitive changes because ACT is a part of CBT, our branch, a third wave branch of CBT, to commit to changes that are gonna help with our anxiety and that can be really helpful too. We need to allow ourselves to be okay with our anxiety and that is one of the really important parts to treatment when it comes to managing our anxiety. We need to allow ourselves to be okay with it and that goes to kind of some of the earlier points in where I've experienced cl clients or individuals use ineffective means that they think are gonna be helpful when it comes to managing their anxiety. We need to learn to be okay with it. The other thing that I would say about managing anxiety is that we actually need to build a better relationship with our anxiety. What is it that the anxiety is trying to tell you? What positive purpose is it trying to serve? And this is something that I always say to clients, that actually anxiety, or based on the subjective experiences, that actually anxiety can have a very positive purpose. If there's a situation or there's something that's going on, we might feel very afraid, we might feel that we're under attack. If I've experienced a really traumatic experience of bullying in, in childhood, I might be really anxious going into new social situations. That anxiety might be saying to me, hold on a second Fraser, like you've been down this road before and it hurt and it was really detrimental to you. I need to try and protect you, I wanna try and help. That anxiety might actually be serving a more positive purpose and that's where we come to understanding the undercurrents, the undertones of what this anxiety is all about. We build a better relationship with it. There are also um, some other more practical steps that can be really useful in uh, managing our anxiety. And those can come in the form of relaxation strategies such as progressive muscle relaxation um, or deep breathing exercises or exercises that allow us to stay present. Those progressive muscle exercises um, for relaxation can be like a staged approach of allowing tension to be released from each part of our body, working from the bottom up at the top down. This can actually be really helpful because often when we have anxiety, we have a lot of tension. It can be expressed in the body to some degree and allowing that tension and that stress to be released can be a very powerful means of managing anxiety. 
as can deep breathing exercises. Now, I'm never a fan of deep breathing exercises that say you need to inhale for eight and exhale for six or whatever. Because actually I find that builds my anxiety because I'm worried I'm not going to reach eight or I'm worried that I'm going too fast or too slow to get to six. So actually just allowing yourself to breathe deeply, this is subjective for me, I found is very, very helpful. And these exercises can be very uh, useful in the process of staying present, which is a very central theme to meditative or mindfulness practices that are also central to ACT. ACT talks a lot about me meditation and mindfulness. And actually when we have anxiety, a lot, often what can happen is we can be so external to the present. We can be so worried about the future or concerned about what happened in the past that we're not present. And these, uh, these strategies can be really useful in allowing us to stay present. One of the other points that I wanted to talk about here was in, in being able to manage our anxiety is that we have to build to the point of challenging our anxiety and then we have to have the courage to step into the dark. Now what I mean by that is that we can do all the work that we want in challenging our anxiety but in order for us to tackle those avoidant behaviours which is so central to managing anxiety there will come a point where we have to do the thing that we're most anxious about. So for example if I have really high social anxiety, the example we talked about earlier if I have really high social anxiety, then you know I'm gonna be scared to go to a place where there's gonna be new people. But it's gonna to get to the point where I'm gonna to have to do that. So we can do all the work we want and, and I'm eventually I'm gonna to have to do that point of stepping out into the dark as I call it. That is never gonna feel comfortable. We're never gonna to get to a point where that's, oh wow, this is absolutely no bother whatsoever. I can talk to everybody, I'm so social, it's fine. Especially if you've experienced social anxiety as an example. You're never gonna to get to that point, of course you're not. Even somebody with really high, you know, really high confidence in social situations is going to feel a bit of anxiety every now and again when they're meeting new people to a degree. So I think there has to be that recognition that there is going to come a point where it's going to feel anxious no matter what happens. You're going to feel anxious no matter what happens, but that's okay. You need to take that courage and take that point to step into the dark. Understanding and challenging negative self-talk is a really important part of managing your anxiety as well and actually it comes to a point of, of that self-esteem development. Negative self-talk is a really important part of self-esteem as well. You can actually access our free self-esteem course on the Get Sight website and we've got this self-esteem Get Sight masterclass coming up in the next few months. Make sure to stay tuned for that because we talk a lot about understanding and challenging negative self-talk and how important that is in our self-esteem management. Um, and ultimately can be also effective for managing anxiety. The way that we talk to ourselves, the kind of things that we say to ourselves, again, if I'm going into a social situation and I have social anxiety, I might be saying to myself, I'm doing this wrong. I'm getting this, or they're looking at me. I'm, I've done something that's not right here. Watching that negative self-talk is a really important way of managing our anxiety. And at the end here, guys, my final point is that we need to seek additional support if we're going to manage that anxiety. Ultimately, what happens is that people with anxiety bottle a lot up, they don't talk about things. Simply the process of talking about our anxiety can be a huge part to our recovery because it just allows that to be expressed, allows that to come out. That's one of the ways in which therapy can be so powerful. Okay guys, hopefully you've enjoyed today's video of Get Sight where we've taken a look at managing anxiety and how to do that. We've looked at what exactly anxiety is, where it comes from, some of the ways in which my personal experience from my professional and personal life where I've seen how people try to manage their anxiety ineffectively and it can lead to more anxiety actually. And we've also looked at my top tips on how to manage our anxiety ultimately. So, hope you guys have enjoyed today's video. If you have, make sure to like the video. You can comment and I'll be sure to get back to you. You can also share the video as well if you like. And if you've been enjoying Get Psyched as a whole, then make sure to subscribe to our channel and you can hit that little bell next to the subscribe button and you get weekly reminders every time we upload. Thanks again so much for watching guys and hopefully catch you next week.